Here's my question. Do we just start the bit over? Now, give us a few minutes to lock down. Just largely very dangerous. Yeah. Groundhog Day hit. I'm, I'm, I just do it. I can. I think I can tell the story a little bit better this time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't be afraid to shoot a message in Slack if it's not working. And I, I should have done that too. Who is this? What's your operating number? Everything's under control. Situation normal. Everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. Are all How are our, you? Are all of our teams okay? Okay. Okay, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Button was there. That's cool. We have a, a well, reactor we really leak here. Uh, now, give us a few minutes good. to lock it down. Uh, <laughs> very like really tremendously. Solved. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're working. I'll never doubt you. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 take it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think what you can do is just delete the the other video, right? You can just take it off the channel. Yeah. Here <laughs> we go again. Nothing happened. So here I was, after having seen Mike's post in the Discord about his beautiful uh, Marvel Comics Star Wars Legends puzzle, that I immediately said, you know what, technically, like those old Marvel Comics count as Legends, therefore, I have to have it. It's got to go in a collection. It's going to be one of these puzzles that I glue together and frame, and so... After going to uh, Walmart's website and Amazon and Target, and hey, I tried using the Utini affiliate link. Don't get me wrong. Uh, finally, I found that it was not in stock at any of the Targets near me, but I tried anyway. I tried looking, went to a few different Targets. Uh, Walmart said it was in stock. Went to four different Walmarts looking for this puzzle. Even got lost in one of them a couple of days after my concussion, which was a whole lot of fun. Calling my wife saying, uh, not only did I not find the puzzle, but I don't know where I am. Uh, anyway, I've seen a doctor. I'm getting better. It's all fine. And especially fine is the fact that now, after having gone to multiple websites, multiple stores in multiple different towns, paying double the price, 10 hours, four nights later, we have the original Marvel Comics puzzle. Uh, I couldn't be prouder, Freddie. That's so awesome. Um, these have gotten a little bit difficult to find, in case you can tell by my rant. Um <laughs> You know, Freddie, you were saying that you're a puzzle guy, but uh, not necessarily a Star Wars puzzle guy. Uh, you got a favorite puzzle you've ever done, Freddie? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of them. There's there's a puzzle that I put together not too long ago where every piece was the same color. So it was all white. Oh, man. And that was a, that was a nightmare. <laughs> and oh. then there was another one I put together in Palm Springs of like uh, of all the post postcards from Palm Springs in that time. And okay. you can imagine how difficult that was. It was like 15 different that's cool. Different yeah. Postcards. So, yeah, I imagine difficult. it looked like this. It just had fewer um, wonky looking Leia's, right? <laughs> Man, Leia looks shank all over this thing, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Han looks pretty good. Uh, Chewie's looking awesome. Vader is looking fly for sure. Yeah. Um, but Leia, oh, bless her heart. How about you, Nathan? Uh, you a puzzle guy? Yeah. So, um, one of my favorite things to do uh, pre pandemic is to go to like vintage stores and antique stores and stuff and hunt for vintage Star Wars stuff. Um, and so one time, you know, I was, I was looking around and I actually found this um, vintage puzzle that was, I think, from 1983. Um, you think? Yeah, just hanger. to be precise. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so that was a pretty cool find. Um, I've done a couple other Star Wars puzzles, but that was definitely the, uh, the best one. Awesome. Man, I have really gotten into it. My wife and I have done a bunch. Finally, after doing seven or eight Star Wars puzzles in a row, my wife said, I'm not doing another Star Wars puzzle with you until we do a Harry Potter puzzle. I was like, <laughs> fine, pick one out. We'll do it. And then I'll get, I've got another one picked out. I'm excited to do. It's like uh, the movie posters from uh, different languages. And uh, it's got like the Revenge of the Jedi poster, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm excited to do that. But right now we're we're stuck hardcore on the Hogwarts Express because everything is black and gray and red. 
and whew, it has taken a while. Um, it, it's been kind of fun. In fact, over Christmas, Freddie, did I tell you this story? We went uh, with my wife's family. We got together over Christmas break. We did like a full two week quarantine ahead of time. We got tested a few days after arrival to allow for the incubation period. I mean, it was this whole ordeal. We stayed um, out of town so that nobody would be dropping by the house trying to, you know, come in, like chat with us. We, we got out like 45 minutes out into the wilderness, rented this, this special campsite. And as soon as I arrived, I could like, I've got the Star Wars radar. I found a whole bunch of unopened boxes of uh, these these Star Wars puzzles and totally jacked one, uh, put it together and then brought it home. And in fact, it's a panoramic puzzle. I can, I can oh, hear that man. puzzle ASMR over here. Um, <laughs> you can actually string it together where, I love this one with Palpatine's face. Look at that, oh, look yeah. at that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I definitely called dibs on doing that one first. So you can actually put the puzzles together and I'm not sure if I've got them right, but they form this panorama. Anyway, a uh, ton of fun. My fingers are building up like those puzzle calluses. So we can <laughs> cross that one off our 2020 bingo card. <laughs> or 2021 at this point, but the pandemic bingo card. And it's it's been awesome. I don't know if I will ever do another puzzle once this pandemic is over, because I'm certainly getting it out of my system. But you know what else I want to get out of my system? This episode of Legends Look Back. We're talking about the Jedi Academy trilogy. It's our second week of the roundtable on this one. Could not be more excited to get into the topics for tonight. I mean, we've got Blobstacle Courses. I mean, if that doesn't hook you, I don't know what does. Wookiee Brutality. We've got, uh, we've got Luke Skywalker's obsession with redemption. I mean, it's going to be a fun episode. So without further ado, let's start the show. <laughs> I don't know if the first or second is better. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Legends Look Back, a show brought to you by Utini.com a Star Wars books podcast you can listen to on your click wheel iPod after you download it on dial up internet. And you know what I'm talking about. Where we talk about all things, Star Wars legends, celebrating our rich EU history, as well as diving into lesser known Star Wars classics. I'm your host, Jared Mace. And uh, today I'm joined by the classiest Californian co-host, Freddie C. What's up, Freddie? Boom, right there. Name. Yeah, we got nameplates this week. <laughs> if you're listening on audio, I don't head on over to YouTube check that out yeah it's going well man i i you know my mom's birthday just happened and she loves antiquing and i definitely don't mind going out with her because i find a lot of star wars goods and i found you a really nice uh princess leia from the dark show it Empire off man comics so throw that, that thing up on screen freddie got me the greatest gift that money can buy dark empire leia <laughs> if you can get it to not reflect too badly in the ring light that's all yeah. this episode is tonight. It's just getting things not <laughs> to reflect too badly. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty That's cool. awesome, so, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's got little uh, expand like a foldable playset looking thing that looks like it's part of the comics. It's hard oh, to see from here. No but, uh, way. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not sure if you're gonna open it, but if you do, there's. I haven't that. decided yet. I haven't decided. I've got some that are in box, some that are not. Um. Oh man, that's that's the greatest gift. I'm I'm not gonna tell my wife, but like, hey. <laughs> Greatest gift I've ever received. I mean, I have yet to receive it. Hopefully, it makes its way over here. Could not be more excited. I I'm excited to to learn that these exist. Skuma Joe in the Discord a few months ago told me that there are Dark Empire action figures I did not know were a thing. <laughs> and now they are definitely on my wish list across uh, all the different platforms. If you're looking to get your favorite host a gift. No, no, no. We won't do that. Uh, we are, however, this week joined by another wonderful host. It is his second time, two weeks in a row, on Legends Look Back. I'm um, joining us once again this week from YouTube and TikTok, Nathan Emery. <laughs> uh, well, or his force ghost, at least. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that out in the audio. Nobody will ever know. Nobody will we'll know. We'll give it a second. <laughs> Welcome to those of us who are joining us in the live chat. All right, here we go. From TikTok, Nathan Emery. What's up? What's up? <laughs> um glad to be here the video had been working until just now so hopefully we can get it back but uh, we'll keep it we'll keep it know, up not, not have a repeat of last week but in and out a little bit here, to be and here there. nonetheless <laughs> <laughs> also this week we are joined by well you could call him the wannabe member of duck dynasty i like to call him the wannabe oppo rancisis filling in for meg this week from texas 
Wes Jenkins. How are you, Wes? I'm great, everyone. <laughs> we'll just go ahead and strike the uh, previous 10 minutes from the record we started at 830, <laughs> but uh, doing good. Doing good so far. Everything is fine. As, yeah, as, thanks uh, for filling in. You know, the good news for you is at least you have a floor. Like, your your entire house hasn't been rearranged due to factors beyond your control. So, F's uh, in the yeah, chat for 100%. Meg. Meg, we hope to have you back. Uh, however, this week, we'll settle for Wes if we have to. Um, this week, we are going to be talking about the Jedi Academy Roundtable, our second week of coverage on that. Uh, before we do, however, you know us over here at Legends Look Back. We've got that collector's itch. I showed off my puzzle. Freddie showed you my uh, Dark Empire Leia. It's going to be headed across the continent one of these days. Um, we also like to talk about some of our other re recent acquisitions. Uh, I know it's only been a week since we last talked about this, guys, but uh, you got any new Star Wars merch, any new Star Wars memorabilia you want to show off? Freddie, I know you went antiquing. You got something for me. Did you get anything for yourself? Yeah, I, I uh, actually got myself the 10-inch Star Wars or Stormtrooper uh, Funko Pop. Did and you? Yeah, it's a sad story. I had that originally in my, uh, you know, thanks to all the Utini people and in Discord. Everyone seems to know when these rare drops are coming down, right? Oh, yeah. So I, I had it in my Target, uh, my shopping cart. I checked out maybe like three days later. Hey, we we flagged this this uh, as a, uh, you know, unauthorized transaction. I was like, unauthorized? That's me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that is my stormtrooper. How could you not put the pieces together? <laughs> Any Star so, Wars transactions, just to prove them, banks. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, I also had some suspicious activity going on on my card the other day. It was all me. I was the suspicious activity. <laughs> um, <laughs> I ended up, yeah, I had my phone. I dropped my phone a few weeks ago. It broke. I've been without a phone. I was waiting for the paycheck to roll through in order to buy a new one because phones, they ain't cheap, especially if you want anything halfway decent. And uh, I may be a redneck, but I want a phone that's at least halfway decent, right? And uh, my last one was quite old. Finally went to buy my new one. And uh, the bank ended up processing it three times because at first <laughs> they wouldn't let me do it. And then I checked my email. They're like, is this you? I was like, yeah, it's me. They're like, awesome. You get all the phones. Here's a phone. There's a phone. That way, if you drop one, you know, hey, you got you to spare. <laughs> anyway, it's been stressful. Uh, how about you, Nathan? You got any new Star Wars merch you want to show off? Um, I got the, uh, the Higher Public number three and higher public adventures number two but i actually oh, don't cool. have them with me in the room but uh no oh, that's exciting great comics yeah, yeah 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 um okay. man love love the high republic uh, uh high republic number three just the marvel one um uh, i won't spoil it here love the the villainous reveals in that in fact i've got a panel from that as the uh the background on my uh, my new phone so um I'm sure <laughs> how, how many covers it. of it do you have uh, I haven't bought, I've only got one one copy of, of number three. I got that Martian Row exclusive cover that looked super sick. Besides that, I was like, I, I, I only intended to collect exclusive covers on issue one. And I, I've had trouble stopping, which is, you know, you know that collector's <laughs> urge. However, for me, what I want to show off this week, I've got four new Funkos in the mail. The concept series, the Ralph McQuarrie, I got the, uh, the Vader with the blue lightsaber, which is cool. The saber's like a little bit bent unfortunately but like not too bad not too bad you probably can't even see over youtube i got the 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 r2d2 with like those chopper grabber arms you know what i'm talking about that's pretty cool. um it, it definitely the inspiration for chopper there kind of like got the chrome polished metal uh spray paint thing going on we got the used car salesman c3po <laughs> <laughs> and then my favorite of the bunch i like to call him quarantine yoda because his hair is even longer than Nathan's over there. Um, Yoda looking like he's had a rough quarantine. And of course, if you're in the collections channel on Discord and you already heard me made that joke today, I am sorry. But I am very much a dad in every looks way. Looks like a sick Legolas. <laughs> sick Legolas. I love this He also Yoda just looks so, so sad. <laughs> like, I want to put a comparison of baby Yoda next to this Yoda Funko Pop. <laughs> just like March 2020, March 2021. Am I right? <laughs> um, my wife said, wait, that huge box has Funko Pops? I was like, eh, yeah, yeah, but I got them at retail price this time. I didn't pay extra. <laughs> so like, it's I mostly guess... packaging. Don't worry. Just She's like, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. My kids were excited to open them with me, but I was like, easy on those neck springs. All right. Those are daddy's toys. 
Um, <laughs> whew, this has been a ton of fun to share those with everybody. I've been excited to show those off. We also like to talk about Legends news at the top of the show. We've talked in recent weeks about how on March 9th, we would have the Dark Empire um, Legends Epic Collection. Well, March 9th has is coming. I mean, it's right around the corner. I've even seen some folks in the Discord showing the fact that this is already shipped for them. The Legends Epic Collection, the New Republic Volume 5, collecting all of the issues of Dark Empire, plus a few random Tales issues, has now shipped. Um, so I'm excited for us to cover... Uh, we're going to talk about Dark Empire 2 and Empire's End here in um, just a few episodes here on the show. Uh, Freddie, you excited to, to dive deeply into that world a little bit more you know some of my very favorite star wars i am i i just looked at my shipping and man it just keeps moving out it is oh, not coming it? anytime soon <laughs> that's what's been happening to my star wars insider the fiction collection so volume one is due on march 23rd mine has been pushed out a little bit unfortunately and there's a little bit more legends news this week and that is we want to wish a happy retirement to Randy Stradley, the legend himself. He was the editor-in-chief at Dark Horse Comics for 35 years. At least I wow. think I've got that number right. I could be wrong. John Jackson Miller tweeted about it, and I heard it on another podcast. And I was like, we got to make sure we talk about that a little bit on the show tonight. So happy retirement to Randy Stradley. If you're a fan of any of the Star Wars Legends uh, stuff that happened over there at Dark Horse, you owe a great of datitude. A grit of datitude? <laughs> <laughs> All right, show's over. Thanks for watching the show tonight. <laughs> we're, we're cutting it here. A debt of gratitude to Randy Stradley. Uh, he's a legend, isn't he, Freddie? <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. He's been, I mean, 35 years, plus or minus even five years is a long time. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, congrats to him for, for seeing it all the way through. And, uh, you know, the amount of things that happened in those 30-some years that he's been around, I'm sure are, are you know, I hope I, I see a memoir of that soon. Oh, man, absolutely. I got to get that signed and framed and got to get the variant <laughs> covers of it and all of it. <laughs> and then finally, in the world of Legends news, hey, we're always plugging, shamelessly plugging other Utini projects. But Freddie and I are both secretly fans of some other things that are not just Utini. Freddie, one of our favorite uh, non-Utini loves is the longest running Star Wars literature podcast on the Internet jedi journals uh yeah. the most recent episode of jedi journals the march 2021 episode i just listened to today on my new phone first podcast i listened to on it um they covered uh, a legends masterpiece which is the uh, dark horse comics kind of in celebration of randy stradley inadvertently they said it was on accident uh they covered the quinlan Voss and ayla sakura arc about uh it's called rite of passage so it's uh, star wars issues 42 through 45 um, Freddie, have you read like that uh, the classic Dark Horse, Ala Secura, Quinlan Boss stuff? Yeah, it's been a long time, but I definitely, uh, I definitely partook in that. I would say it, it's it was Quinlan Voss and Ala Secura. First of all, were were when that that whole situation happened, right? In in the what is that Dark Disciple? Yeah, yeah. Most recently, it's it's yeah. uh, Quinlan and um, Ventress. Ventress, that's right. And then uh, Isla Sakura, when she comes in and, and you kind of get a little bit more of Quinlan Voss and, and uh, who he is. And, and man, I have to admit, I never, I overlooked him at first. I overlooked Quinlan Voss and it wasn't because I, didn't, I wasn't interested in his character, but he just wasn't, you know, the, the name that I knew. Yeah, but sure. the more I started to read up on him, I, I really dug him as a character. And, and you know, I, I like I like that we can claim that right in our <laughs> in legends. That's right. That's right. There's so much more. Hey, if you like Dark Disciple, wait till you touch Legends. I mean, there's like a hundred issues of Quinlan Voss yeah. in Legends, and it is absolutely some of the finest Star Wars stories ever written. Love, absolutely love those from John Ast Ostrander and I think Jan Dersima. If I'm not wrong, let the double check my facts on that. But we'll cover those on the show one of these days. So it was a great episode, guys over there uh, at Jedi Journals. Loved that stuff. Talking about um, some classic Legends content. As soon as they said we're talking about Legends, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'm so glad I turned <laughs> on this episode. Because I don't listen to everyone anymore. I've been listening to this thing for like 10 years. Yeah. Um, I can't catch them all. But I uh, was so excited that I did this time. But enough about uh, other people's Legends projects. Let's talk about our own tonight we are finishing our coverage of the jedi academy trilogy talking about jedi search dark apprentice and champions of the forest we're not getting into all the trivia that we did last week as much as to say these came out in 1994 
and uh, they are still around today in 2021, and <laughs> you won't regret it if you read them, and if you do regret it, please don't tell me or leave an angry comment on this YouTube video. Last week, we talked about the characters. We got uh, the, the, the many members, uh, about a dozen of them, depending on how we're doing our math, you know, whether or not we're counting the Corin, Corin Horn retcon, right? Um, on whether or not he was at the academy, it's about a dozen members. There's like you know seven or eight in um, in that are actually a part of the trilogy that get like a speaking role or any kind of significance. Uh, just a tremendous amount of world building that Kevin J. Anderson is putting together. Last week we talked about uh, Luke and we talked about Han and Leia and Kip Duran and his genocidal mania. This week, however, we're talking about some of the bigger overarching themes throughout the trilogy first and foremost uh, in reading jedi search which uh, we could talk about this which one we think is the strongest of the trilogy i think probably for me it was jedi search um it was it was so much fun to just dive into this uh, in the first place a lot of uh, laying the groundwork in the first volume there and so much of that first book takes place on kessel you know as i was like 100 pages in i was thinking you know, Kessel was absolutely a phenomenal choice to set this Star Wars book on. Remember, we're still the early days of Legends here. Some of these planets that are, are given one line in the original trilogy are never seen on screen. And so what better place to explore some of these um, some of these stories than the expanded universe? Am I right, Nathan? Um, do you think that uh, Kessel was a good choice for setting the first volume in... Um, in this new Jedi Academy trilogy? I say new. It was new in 1994, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like like you said, it, there's so much that's not explored in Kessel and stuff in the original trilogy. And so, you know, he really does a lot of world building um, with the minds and like with how Spice is mined and the creatures and just like, you know, everything on it. And, you know, side note, it's really cool to see how much of what's in here and how Kessel's depicted ends up, you know, in solo. Um, it really is almost one-to-one, -one. not entirely. Yeah. There's, no, there's no spiders. I don't think in solo, <laughs> um, but uh, definitely who, who was it? One of the writers on that said they were big fans of some of the like nineties EU. Um, it was, let's see the, you had like the, the father son duo on solo. I'm flying off the cuff here. Freddie, help me out. Um, the writer on solo uh Lawrence Kasdan and his son yeah. John Kasdan there we go yeah. John Kasdan was was big into like uh, we got to get him on the podcast one of these days uh <laughs> big into like the 90s EU stuff so um you know we got the Ma especially the Kessel Run itself is depicted in the film and um is depicted to, in a certain extent in this book as well uh Freddie how about you are you a fan of Kessel if you had a vacation somewhere it probably wouldn't be <laughs> Kessel but <laughs> yeah what was your opinion on Kessel in this book so first of all, you know, Nathan brought it up. Kessel has been mentioned by name only in a lot of different EU comics and books, right? It was always, oh, on Kessel this, or the Spice Mines of Kessel, Slaves on Kessel, et cetera, et cetera. But never have we actually gone to the planet surface to figure out what is Kessel? Who, wh what is this place? Why is everyone talking about it? And why does it suck here, right? Why... <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and you know you you get a lot of sense I, I, and i'll never forget reading jedi search when you're hanging out with han solo and he, he he's talking about or you know it's his thought process of him going down into the sh into the mine shaft and how that pinhole of light just gets smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where <laughs> yeah. you barely yeah, see that was it. really well done yeah, and I'm just like, this is terrifying. I hate Kessel. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite things about the, the EU, especially the early days of the EU, um, is is when you've got a, you know, like a one line, the original trilogy, and then you can have an entire trilogy, right? Or, an, uh, a, you know, an yeah. entire book that's just dedicated to fleshing out what that one line was all about. So our first episode ever, Freddie, was on Death Troopers. And that's basically predicated on the fact that Han says, I've been from one side of this galaxy to the other, and I've seen a lot of strange stuff. Yeah. And um, that's basically the premise of the book is we're going to see some of that strange stuff, right? <laughs> and so in, in this book, it's like, you know, you've got, is it 3PO? It's like, oh, they'll send you to the Spice Mines of Kessel for sure for that one. Um, don't quote me on that, please. <laughs> um, don't make a gift of that, whatever you do. Um, I, I especially love that this book is like, all right, well, let's just get Han and Chewie stuck in the Spice Mines of Kessel. Let's have them imprisoned. 
and uh, we're gonna find all the weirdness that's going on under there. I love Morith Duel, the like prison warden, oh, kind of goodness. like a kind of reptilian. Is he reptilian or amphibian, Freddie? Do you I remember? believe he's a he frog. Pictured... Okay, <laughs> I pictured him as like a like a a Trandoshan mixed with a hut. <laughs> I, I can't. What was his species name again? I can't remember his his species name off the. Off the cuff. Yeah, if it's not in the show notes, that I couldn't tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they they did a lot of good world building with him. Worth duel. He didn't make the characters episode. We had to make sure we gave him a shout out here. Uh, did love the way that Kessel is characterized in this book, especially because um, you you get so much world building in terms of learning that uh, it's in fact the spice is 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 kind of a byproduct of these glitter stem spiders that live down in the spice mines. And, and if they're ever exposed to light, you know, the, the product is ruined. And then of course, like Han and Kip and Chewie, they bust out of there and ruin the whole supply <laughs> of it. And, you know, it's, a, they're like, uh, you know, Lando eventually comes back and he's like, I'm going to try to get these drugs and sell them. And uh, it's just, <laughs> this, this downward spiral into the darkness. And, and it's kind of scary, you know, um, reading this i would suggest at least having a dim lamp on or something because otherwise you know uh, you can kind of feel claustrophobic can't it nathan reading about oh, yeah. being in the spice mines and, and this it's absolute pitch black and you hear the noises of the spiders and they're not sure what it is yeah and i mean like freddie was saying you know there's the when they're going down into the mine and han's like tripping over other people you really feel like and he's like he, he closes his eyes and he's not sure you know, he's like, I can't tell if my eyes are closed or open. You know, it's yeah. some really good description of like, this is just pitch black and you're going to be down here for, you know, who knows how many hours yeah. every day. Getting, they lose track of time. They don't know what, what day it is. Uh, I mean, it feels like the pandemic all over again. Um, <laughs> just stuck down in the Might not have clothes. toilet paper. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I don't think that the glitter stem spice would be good for that. Anyway, I uh, won't go down that rabbit hole. One of the big criticisms of the Jedi Academy trilogy, though, I do think Kessel is one of its stronger points. One of its big criticisms is that it doesn't build on the events and characters established in the Thrawn trilogy. Now, I think Kevin J. Anderson does a tremendous amount of world building. It's probably his strongest trait as an author. It's his imagination in terms of laying the groundwork for what was to come and for decades in Legends and eventually even on screen in movies like Solo. Um, it, it doesn't really build much on what's established in the Thrawn trilogy. And, and as I was writing this question, you know, I was, I was going to ask, do you think that's an intentional oversight in favor of the Dark Empire chronology? I said on last week's show that, that he references Dark Empire on like every page. But Freddie, you busted out some trivia on me earlier today concerning the relationship with the Jedi Academy trilogy and the, and the Thrawn trilogy, as well as with Dark Empire. You want to expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so I don't have it open in front of me right now, but but basically what it was telling me is is there was a major decision made with Lucasfilm uh, or LucasArt. I, I always get those confused on who, who yeah, controls Lucasfilm. what. Yeah, LucasArt Lucas is the video games. That's right. Okay, so Lucasfilm decided to make a change in in, I guess, the storytelling and what was going to be happening around that time. And Kevin J. Anderson had had written it previously with with something in mind, and I, I'm trying to look up the the exact note here. Basically, um, where they were saying that it was going to be a direct sequel to the Thrawn trilogy. It exactly. was going to build much more on the Thrawn trilogy, and then he found out, oh, actually, we've shoehorned the Dark Empire chronology after the Thrawn trilogy in order to try to make this all cohesive, even though it totally isn't. <laughs> exactly. <Yep. laughs> so he had to make a like a last minute pivot to try to make this a sequel to Dark Empire mm -hmm. rather than a sequel to the Thrawn trilogy. Does that about sum it up? That that exactly sums it up. And and what kind of <laughs> he was worried that that Dala's attack on on Mon Calamari oh, yeah. was going to to almost be a little redundant because of the world devastators that were just there, right? And right. And so uh, he, you know, he was very worried about that. I'm sure he had to rewrite it because it, it does kind of seem like a um you know, it does seem almost like he's stealing the idea or just not really being creative. And I could understand where where he wants to. I mean, but we're, we're talking about the days before before email was even really widely used. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, like yeah. if you want to have a creative decision or like any kind of collaboration, it's like you're on the phone and we're talking about the phone. We're like you have to stand next to the wall with like that curly cord. It's like <laughs> you can't even walk to the other room. You're stuck there next to the wall. If you want to have a conversation, you got to like twist the dial in order to make your <laughs> your phone calls. Um uh, you snail mail you might get a letter that says by the way 
change your entire trilogy. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, what am I going to do? Uh, I got to pull out all my floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to fix this thing, I mean, it's just an absolute nightmare today. Not that big of a deal. You just put out a tweet that's like, it's delayed two months. We've got a, something that's got to change. But back yeah. then, I mean, it's, it's a tremendous hurdle for an author. So it hats off to Kevin J. Anderson. I, I'm going to go ahead and remove my criticism about the fact that this doesn't build enough on the Thrawn trilogy. I would, however, like to know what that version would have looked like. What about you? Yeah. I think it'd be interesting, actually, if, if you were to really do a direct sequel right after, right? Uh, everyone's kind of, <laughs> everyone's relieved because Thrawn is now gone and, and everything's cooling down. But now you've got multiple threats, right? You've got the uh, Imperial Training Facility, <laughs> Imperial Training Planet, I should say, not even a facility. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you've got Dala, who's just out there wreaking havoc. On yeah, another warlord, right? Um, exactly. She's, and then of she's course not got... obsessed with art. She's just obsessed with blowing stuff up. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got Kip, right? Who's like, he's that that he's like that cannon that's sitting right next to the bonfire. <laughs> Absolutely. Just, please do not blow up everything. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, so I am interested in, we're going to talk about this on an upcoming episode. We're going to have Trevor on. We're going to talk about like the the lost legends of legends, mm -hmm. kind of the the stories that had started or were in development and then were canned for whatever reason. And we've got them across all of the Legends continuity books that, of course, infamously were abandoned because of the Disney sale and the Legends canon split mm -hmm. in 2014, such as Sword of the Jedi. But there were also some early Legends books, you know, we're talking about like early 90s, 91, 92 there was, in fact, Freddie, and I can't wait for us to talk about this. There was a book that was uh, canned in favor of the Truce of Bakura. Freddie, oh. the Truce of Bakura almost wasn't. <laughs> I mean, there was almost another book. It's called The Heart of the Jedi. I've been reading it. I'm, I'm 10 chapters in at this point. I'm loving it. Uh, I won't say whether or not I love it more than Truce of Bakura. <laughs> we'll save that for the show. But, uh, I mean, it just goes to show how we've come a long way in terms of collaboration between Star Wars creators, especially now that we're looking at the High Republic. Um, you know, Nathan, talk about just how far we've come in terms of collaboration. I know you're a big High Republic fan. You just uh, did one of our reviews on one of these books. I forget what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've done uh, Light of the Jedi and yeah, yeah, the Victory's big one. Price just now. But, um, but yeah, one of the interesting things to me, reading like this and Truce of Bakura and some of the older Legends books is um, you know, how much the authors have to draw on like the inspiration of the original movies. Um, one of the lines that struck me in, I think champions was, yeah. When, when Han is talking down Kip and he's like, you know, I used to not believe in the force. In fact, I once said it was, you know, a bunch of mumbo jumbo or something like that. Like there's so much inspiration from the films and like the characters in the film. Um, whereas now, you know, with the higher public and everything else, it's like there it's planned down. Every single detail is planned before the books are written, you know, everybody knows exactly who the characters are, everything like that. Um, whereas back then it was kind of like, well, you know, there's some almost room for interpretation between, you know, the different authors and how they portrayed these characters. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, you've got the original trilogy, you've got the the Weston game source books. If you want to take a look at those, <laughs> uh, Timothy Zahn really did. Kevin J. Anderson really didn't. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's fun to kind of see the way that the different authors go different directions. And eventually it, it all coalesces later in Legends. There wasn't necessarily the collaboration at this point. And they were learning along the way. And that's kind of the fun of Legends is is, is kind of feeling the collaboration happen along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time we get to like those later series like Legacy of the Forest, you've got a very strict collaboration happening. Um, yeah. You got nine books, three authors. Three books apiece. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And yeah. they're working with each other. They're much more cohesive, though not perfectly so. And they're building off all this. I mean, it's really a swan song. Uh, Legends, uh, Legacy of the Forest and Fate of the Jedi, really a swan song to everything established in the Jedi Academy trilogy. All those characters are, for the most part, a couple of them die along the way. Um, but <laughs> a lot of them, like Silgal, are on the Jedi Council by the time we get to those books, which is so great. And I love that. But uh, you know what else is great in this series? The Blobstacle Courses. That's what I right. look like right now. <laughs> yeah, that's what Freddie looks like over there pixelated in this video. Um, this is one of these things that happens in this series where I've got to admit, I've listened to the um, the abridged audiobooks of the Jedi Academy trilogy a bunch. 
uh, but had had not gone through these word for word in the unabridged form in 20 years. I mean, it's since I was a kid. And so enjoyed this time around, just taking my time through them. And in particular, got to the Blobstacle courses and like, I did not remember this at all. It was one of those things where it was like 11, 1130 at night. I turned to my wife who like is tired of a capital T tired of hearing about Star Wars at this point, like <laughs> shook her and woke her up and was like, listen to this. There's blobs and it's like horse races, like they're betting on them. Lando's at the horse races, but they're blobs, like big goo balls. And they're literally called blobstacle courses. <laughs> <laughs> he was like he woke me up for this and i was like absolutely i did i mean it's not every day you get to hear about blobstacle courses uh freddie i know you've gotten into running a little bit this year if uh if the utini team like all 30 of us were in a blobstacle course race we are the blobs in this scenario <laughs> who wins in a blobstacle course race on the utini blobstacle Ooh. course olympics i mean uh i think uh Nathan and Meg and, that, and there's there seems to be some some very hardcore runners in in Utini. I yeah, seen, Emily's uh, Emily's training for an ultra marathon. Yeah, yeah, and I I'm not even at the 5K level yet. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, hitting an ultra marathon it, it, that's amazing, man. That's some that's some yeah. crazy endurance. The 15 pounds that I gained over Christmas, um, I don't know if they they might actually help me out in the blobstacle horse race because I got to put on some poundage in order to qualify as a blob in the first place. <laughs> Um, depends on the distance. Obviously, Emily would have us beat if we're talking about long distances. Um, if it was like one lap around the track, maybe, maybe I used to, you know, I ran a 52, okay. 400 meter in high school. Um, uh, ran in state, you know, with that one, I didn't do well in state, but I got there. <laughs> 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 but you, Nathan, who would win a Bob school course race? The serious, hard hitting questions you get asked on Legends Look Back. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> i think the the thing we're overlooking is a blobstacle course isn't just about speed it's also about like you know who can take out other blobs it's you know it's kind of a free-for-all and so i don't know i feel like somebody like Corey, who's just like hyper competitive and would do anything <laughs> to win would That's at right. least take a few few Corey of the, would uh, cheat, the faster he would definitely down. cheat he absolutely would he would pull his like <laughs> ceo status on us too so i i don't know i'd pick Corey to win it <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wes, if I had told you ahead of time that uh, Blobstacle courses were in these books, would you think I was making it up or that I was serious? There's a lot of things that happen in <laughs> Legends that I am not surprised <laughs> about to, at all anymore. Especially when I hear you talking about it. So, uh, Blobstacle, Blobstacle courses? courses? Eh, I mean, again, this is another like, I'd like to see it for myself, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Why, why didn't this make Solo a Star Wars story? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I mean, the other thing about him is we talked about last week how like Yantoris is, you know, the red herring dark apprentice. I mean, this was the like a super long red herring, you know, with oh, very yeah. little actual bearing on the story. They thought it was, you know, T Temin, I think was his name. They thought he was a Jedi right. and then it just turned out not to be. And it was like, yeah, that's right. The 75 pages that they had just spent on this. They, they go so... around. Go ahead, Freddie. <laughs> So this is where I remember I, I told you, I feel like they didn't expand on certain stories enough, but it's because they had all their investment in this blobstacle race. And I mean, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I feel like <laughs> I feel like they were just trying to fill up some some or at least bring bring Lando in, make him a little bit more relevant by making him go to the the blob races. Right. And the fact that he's like, oh, blob races. I mean, I can't wait to get in on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, man. priorities of legends i guess well you make a good point that that there's a lot of time spent on this and it goes nowhere absolutely nowhere <laughs> now on the one hand if your book is about like finding jedi apprentices if every single storyline is like oh hey we've got a lead on a jedi apprentice and then it's like we bagged him we got him to the academy that's a little bit too predictable you've got to have at least one where they're like this guy hey we already could be a jedi only to find out that they're not i mean it makes sense that there would be one that wouldn't work out I mean, I don't mean didn't work out like Gantoris, uh, R.I.P. Gantoris, <laughs> F's in the chat for Gantoris, who exploded. <laughs> um, I, I especially like the fact that the, in each one of these books across the trilogy, there's one significant storyline that goes absolutely nowhere. Unlike <laughs> any Star Wars book I've ever read. I mean, really goes nowhere. Um, another one of these plot lines that I really loved that just just like, why is this the way that it is, is the 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 plot line surrounding babysitting Jason and Jaina. 
Uh, is it oh, C-3PO and, and, and Chewbacca, and Chewbacca. Who, are, who are babysitting Jason and Jaina? And they're like, they're just doing yep. an abysmal job at it. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure if I read this correctly. I'd have to go back. But even towards the end, they were still losing them. And it almost seems like a trope where it's like, oh, there we go again, losing the kids. <laughs> oh, I yeah, know. they it did. Really they was. did bring it up again one time, like yeah. in Champions, I think. But yep. oh, like it was man. the trope for them to lose the kids all the time. It yep. really was just amazing the way that uh, that storyline devolved. They basically go to like the under levels of Coruscant in an elevator. And they're just like, there's there's like thugs, there's monsters, <laughs> there's slime, there's like blood and glass and drugs. And there's like these two four-year-olds walking around. And they're like, uh, I don't know about this, Jason. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> Just like knowing that these would be like two of the heavy hitters in Legends, two of the most iconic EU characters. And they're just lost alone in the underlevels of Coruscant, which brings up a good point, though. And that's this, a very important question. Um, Freddie, if you were in charge of babysitting Jason and Jaina at four years old. Um, actually, let's start with you, Nathan. Nathan, you can go first on this one. Um, if you're in charge of babysitting Jason and Jaina, uh, what do you do? How do you entertain them? I mean, in this series, there's like there's there's a holographic zoo of extinct animals. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at that in the show notes. I remember typing it, but I'm like second guessing myself. I'm like, it, did that actually happen or did I make that up in a fever <laughs> no, dream? <that> happened. <laughs> it happened. OK, uh, what would you do? Have you thought about this? Are you much of a babysitter, Nathan? <laughs> I'm not. I have a few times. Um, but, you know, I mean, this series, it really, like, increased my respect for C-3P. I mean, he's the only one. Like, you know, Han and Leia, they can't take care of the kids. Chewbacca can't. Like, they love C-3P, and he does a great job parenting. But um, Yeah, he does. He's, like, reading yeah, bedtime I don't know. stories. Yeah, they would be uh, difficult kids. I don't know. Maybe you just got to go, like, fly them around Coruscant. I mean, not, you know, even the zoo of holographic animals could not entertain them at all so you might just i mean you know hyperspace jumping planet to planet that might be enough excitement for them well, what's know. funny is we we get this glimpse in return of the jedi of c-3po as a storyteller right he's like uh, banda kadosh you know as he's uh, telling <laughs> the story around the campfire uh, on indoor and uh in, in this he like tries telling a bedtime story like that but it scares them and they're like, shut up, C-3PO. <laughs> and they start <laughs> yeah. crying. And I was like, it would. Like, he would scare them. He would brighten them. It's then, like not very motherly, this golden droid. Where's he at? Sorry, buddy. Uh, you're not the best, not the best mother figure, gotta tell you. Um, uh, he always was like, Oh, I've, I've added this to my programming, I've updated my my parental <laughs> programming right. to accommodate this situation. Yeah. So not the best snuggler, that gold uh, <laughs> droid skin. What would you do, Freddie? How would you entertain the... I mean, I've got a couple kids, right? I mean, this is my daily life. Um, yeah. Today, I was like, all right, get in the stroller. We're walking the dog. They're like, it's 30 degrees. I'm like, we're walking the dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. It was great. We loved it. I would just bundle up. What would you do, Freddie? How would you entertain Jason and Jaina? Yeah, this is tough. I uh, I don't really interact with kids daily, so it's, it's not something that I, I know how to do. <laughs> so it'd be very much the uh, let's go to the closest uh, store and buy a Revan figure. There you Remember go. Remember that guy, Revan? Let's guys? go buy toys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but like, hey, some of these toys are for me. And yeah, I exactly. Mess up the next two, springs. two of each. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's the way to go. I mean, two of each. One for daddy, one for you. Um, uh, well, now I just called Freddy daddy. This is getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know what else is weird is this opening scene in Champions of the Force. Uh, I mean, it is it is absolutely one of the most crushing moments. I mean, it caught me off guard. We're talking about a trilogy here that's got uh, Blobstacle Courses and babysitting Jason and Jaina with a holographic zoo of extinct animals. And then book three begins with, you know, genocide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the opening of Champions of the Force is absolutely one of the most heartbreaking and powerful uh, beginnings of of any Star Wars book I've ever read. Uh, Freddie, you want to talk about that? I mean, for this, this is like the one of two or three things that really stands out to me as memorable about this trilogy and the you know dozen times that I've read it is the opening of Champions of the Force. Freddie, I'm going to go ahead and pause it and I want you to argue with my thesis here whether or not you agree. Is this the most powerful beginning to a Legends book ever? Uh, that's... That's tough to say. I'm trying to think of like the beginnings of a lot of these books and and I would say the genocide and everything. That's 
it's pretty intense to read. I mean, it, it's it's very uh, it's not what you expect to read in Star Wars, right? You 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 expect to just have a fun time going on this pirate slash swashbuckling adventure. Yeah. But you know, talking with some people like Cheryl and and uh, Charlie and and Eric, you really see a lot of the heavy hitting points in Star Wars and. You know, thinking about Star Wars and genocide, yes, the the Emperor was very he was very much a genocidal person. Like if it if it did something to make the Empire stronger, he was gonna do it at all costs. Like right? we can so, blow up your planet if we want to. Exactly, right? And yeah, and uh I mean think about it, getting rid of like all the Alderanians and uh you know, a beautiful planet and and it just what what makes it less possible to do it for like another species right and we know for a fact that in star wars there was definitely even in in you know uh x-wing uh what was what was that virus the the kratos yeah virus the kratos virus kratos virus yeah the kratos, kratos is virus. the like mythological <laughs> being yeah that's right <laughs> kratos is the star wars disease <laughs> yeah so i mean the, genocide is very much a part of star wars and and uh you know having it at the very beginning is definitely uh it, it sets the tone well, and it's because it's personal for Kip, right? He loses yeah. his brother. He goes to Karita, and they're like, the Imperials, they they try to foil him by saying, like, no, your brother's dead. And then he's like, all right, fine, I'll blow you all up. And then they're like, oh, no, actually, your brother's right here. If you want to talk to him, he's like, yeah. too late. I'm blowing you up. And then he's like, his brother's right there on the ladder getting into the ship. And then the planet explodes, and his yeah. brother's dead. I mean, it's it's absolutely crushing. I think the personal level makes the genocide all the more meaningful. Not that the billions of people that he killed didn't matter, but for us as the reader to feel Kip's anguish and losing that one person, you realize there's thousands, there's billions of people who lost that one person in this yeah. accident. And it comes back to bite him. It comes back to bite Kip. There are um, Imperials later on, I think in the New Jedi Order, maybe Legacy, Fate of the Jedi, um, high ranking Imperials who, who eventually, you know, they're going to have an alliance with the rebellion, the new Republic to form a, a broader, more long lasting government. And they're like, listen, we will not cooperate with a government that keeps the killer, like the, the genocidal Jedi mm -hmm. on the council in an established yeah. position with no um, ramifications for his behavior. Uh, Nathan, I know you're pretty well read. Do you think this is the uh, most powerful start to any legends book ever? It could be. And I've been thinking through like the legends books I've read and most of them, from what I know, they start with like, you know, an introduction to the characters. They, right. they start slow. Um, but I mean, in terms of like emotional significance, obviously this is very different, but you know, it, the, the raw emotion of the moment did remind me a lot of, you know, a certain death in the, uh, the new Jedi order. And actually the way it happened was, yeah. was very similar as well, but in terms that's of openings, I mean, yeah, I can't really think of anything that's kind of, you know, on this level. Yeah, yeah you know, that that particular death happens maybe two thirds. Uh, it could be third act of that book. So I, I love the opening line in Rogue Squadron. I think it's the, the best opening line in all of literature ever, not just Star Wars. It's uh, about Corrin Horn. We talked about this is a couple of years, a year and a half ago at this point, Freddie. Uh, it says, you're good, kid, but you're no Luke Skywalker. And it's, it's about Corrin. I just love that line. Yeah. It immediately sets the tone that Corrin sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, we're in on the joke. Uh, that's the whole point. Um, I love that. I, I also love the opening to some of those Republic Commando books. They'll open with like a really crazy fun heist adventure with the mm -hmm. clones. Those are, But it's not crushing in the same way as this. The yeah. only other thing I can think of that compares out of all my Legends knowledge, I'm not ready, every Legends book, but most, is the opening to the first Coruscant Knights book is, spoiler alert for the first 20 pages of that, the Jedi Master Evan Peel dies in you know, by at the, at the hand of an Inquisitor or something like that in the first, uh, you know, first chapter of that book. And he like his dying wish is that his Padawan, Jax Pavan, would carry on his mission to overthrow Palpatine or, or save the Jedi Order or restart the Rebellion or something like that. I don't know. It's been... I've, I've read like 15 Star Wars books since then, but uh, that one's crushing because it's like, oh, he's this nice little funny, scarred, big-eared Jedi Council member. He's, you know, uh, and then he's, uh, you know, he kind of, he dies. And I said this the other day in the Living Force live chat. He's the most dead of all the Jedi Council members. He dies, <laughs> he dies twice in Legends yeah, and then does. one more time in Canon in the Clone Wars. Uh, so uh, can I get Fs in the chat for Evan Peel who dies and he dies some more, and he dies a lot. 
<laughs> uh, so I do love the opening to this. Love it in like a heartbreaking l- yeah. literary kind yeah. of way. Not I don't love it in the same way that I love Blob's cool course. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing, right? It's all an ethical dilemma. You know what else is an ethical dilemma is uh, another point of kind of heartbreak in this series is when um, you know Han and Chewie uh, are they're kind of helping the. Um, the, the, the Wookiees who have been on this Imperial base in the Ma installation. Is it Han and Chewie? Could be the rebel strike team that comes to try to help liberate that facility. Um, oh, it's Wookiee. Yeah, it's, it's Chewie because he definitely wants yeah, to save the Wookiees. Up, Han's he's like, there, he's yeah. like, I'm not going to leave until we save the Wookiees. And that was yeah, translated I, from Shuri Wook, Kip, by the way. Kip is in the detention center uh, on with Dala, right? That's where that whole thing happens. Oh, yeah. He's like tortured. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, these these imperial lady overlords, like the the admirals, they love to tie up their men. Like the the Jedi's, they, you got um, Corn Horn gets tied up by Isard and strapped yeah. naked to a chair, and um, then we've got and I'm not kidding, it actually happens. Yep, in this fictional universe, it actually happens in this fake stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. and then. And- you just got to remember when it was written, you know, the 90s uh, Baywatch era is what I try to remind myself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not the rock Baywatch, the, the other stuff. The yeah, yeah, the old one. Yeah. Um, so in, in this one, we've got uh, Dala you know, tying up Kip Duran. So it's not a Legends book if a Jedi doesn't get tied up by an <laughs> uh, Imperial overlord. Um, but in this particular chapter, there's this, uh, you know, the liberation of the Wookiees. You've got Chewbacca uh, trying to free his his Wookiee brothers, uh, much like we get in Solo with that scrawny, you know, underfed Wookiee. And you're like, ooh, is that a Wookiee? I don't like that at all. But it's much like that. But in this particular version, they're not just like, you know, jogging out of the prison with this, you know, droid revolt. They take the heads of their Imperial captors and smash them into the walls. I mean, it was some Old Testament stuff going on in here. I mean, it was <laughs> yeah. super brutal. Um, you want to talk about that Wookiee brutality, Freddie? Uh, this really ties into kind of some real world issues here where there's been a lot of arguments about protests, right? It's like, well, why can't we protest? more civilly and it's we always say that from the position of privilege right it's like well we can be critical of those who are upset we want them to be upset in a nice way just be upset peacefully right um whereas these wookies like they've been enslaved and you just you can feel their rage coming out at you off the page i mean you learn that wookies can rip people's arms out of their sockets and there's arms flying all over the place in this book (laughs) yeah there is (laughs) There is. Uh, it, it really goes down to if you are right. These these are slaves. These Wookies are definitely hundred percent slaves. They are being whipped by an energy uh, energy whip. I guess it is. So they're you know they've got burns. Uh, they're 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 kept in probably the worst environment for them. It's sanitized. They prefer like the humidity of the jungle. But here they right. are inside of a, a a star destroyer or whatever it is. And um, uh, and it, it's sad to see them in that position. And you can also imagine once once they become, once they are no longer the captives, do you really expect them to show pity? I I mean I I if I if I said if I saw the Wookies express pity, that's you know not really the expectation. To me, the expectation is absolute demolition. Yeah, um, you know, it, it really does make sense why they do it. And when I read about it in this fictional book, I'm like, it makes sense that they would be angry. But then we see it in the real world and we're like, oh, I don't know. I wish yeah. that people could just, you know, protest the way that I'm more comfortable with. You want to speak to this, some, um, Nathan? Um, you don't have to hit the political angle, but uh, did you feel like in this particular instance that their revenge against their captors was was too much for you or an appropriate reaction being enslaved? Yeah, I mean... You know, the, the thing with the Wookiees and the way they're depicted, you know, throughout leg- legends is that they're, you know, fiercely loyal and fiercely loving, but also, you know, they have a temper. And so, uh, you know, I, I guess from a character standpoint and also just from a standpoint of understanding, you know, the situation they were in, I think it totally makes sense, like how angry they got. And I mean, obviously, this is an issue that um, KJA brings up also with Kip, right? Like he grew up basically in the minds of Kessel and, you know, he gets out and he has a lot of anger. So it's like sure. how much, I guess, is justified or forgivable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, against they're not people acclimated to society. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's, you know, I mean, that's also what we deal with in the real world is like how much is understandable and forgivable and, you know, how far can people go in the name of anger and like righteous and justified anger? Yeah. I'll tell you this much. I am never going to enslave any Wookiees or humans. All right. (laughs) There's just no slavery. Uh, Would you go ahead and put that stamp of approval on legends look back we do the stamp of disapproval we do not approve of slavery uh towards humans or wookies in a galaxy far far away or uh, this galaxy it doesn't matter it's not a good thing all right i think we can all agree on that one regardless of our politics or our uh, our worldview um you know we've talked about the wookies we've talked about kip duran we've talked about uh, jason and jaina and the extinct animals and the blobstacle courses um we need to talk about two more uh major characters uh, story arcs before we are done tonight and that is Exar Kun and on the opposite end of the spectrum Luke Skywalker himself let's start with the villainous and we'll end on a high note with Luke okay um how exactly and we talked about this some last week and I don't think I'm any clearer after a week thinking about it how exactly did they defeat Exar Kun uh there's a retcon in I Jedi and it's kind of like well secretly it was Mara and uh, and Corin, who distracted Exar Kun, so that the other Jedi could feel like they won, right? That they, that they had overpowered him, but really it was Corin Horn. You know, Corin Horn is the one who really <laughs> defeats Exar Kun, right? And I'm yeah, sure Ma- right, Mara was like, "Yeah, right, Corin. It was actually me, right?" Uh, M- M- Corin couldn't have done it without Mara, which I love that pairing of Corin and Mara. That's the best part of that book for sure. Uh, Freddie, how do you think they actually defeated Exar Kun and like uh, a, a strategic? standpoint i mean obviously timothy zahn would spell it out very specifically if he was writing the book in terms of the military strategy and the battle tactics and anderson doesn't do that it's a very different kind (laughs) of victory that's the funniest thing that that i I, i'm just bringing this to to light in my own brain right now is i don't actually know how they did it i just remember them that that xr coon was there and then he wasn't (laughs) and i don't really know how that (laughs) how that happened and uh you're right there's there's a very there's almost like a blank spot in my own brain as if they they just deleted that memory for me as i was reading it and uh, clearly it wasn't it wasn't uh mem- it wasn't enough for me to memorize you know and and i can't even tell you how exactly that happened just from the force of of goodwill i guess i don't know <laughs> the way i summarized it last week in the the episode summary is that they defeated him with the power of positive thinking and the light side of the force and teamwork or some combination of those three. Like they finally realized that they needed to come together and like overcome their fears and start acting like Jedi who don't operate out of fear, but out of uh, like peacefulness and positive thinking. Yeah. And when they finally held hands and raised their lightsabers up into the sky uh, they intimidated Exar Kun with their positivity into disappearing for all eternity. Is that about right, Nathan? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's about right. It's kind of just the power of the power of light and, and love. I guess the way I think about it, you know, I have it pictured in my brain um, from both times I read it. It's kind of like in uh, in Bane when they all just kind of pull like their their force powers and the, connect their minds a little bit and just mm-hmm. kind of you know, I guess banish him away, but, uh, yeah, yeah it is, a. Uh, it's, it seems like it, it's kind of up for uh, individual interpretation. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let us know in the chat, let us know in the comments, how do you think they defeated Exar Kun? How would you defeat Exar Kun? If you were rewriting this book, um, uh, who's really responsible? Is it, uh, <laughs> is it screen screen? And, and the other Strain. Jedi's <laughs> so yeah. Re- yeah. Right. Stream. You really Door defeated Exar Kun. Sure. You did. <laughs> You or, know, or I'm just it, gonna go. I'm gonna go it, with the 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 vibe was the post home run vibe, and you know they're just <laughs> just the the spanking, the uh, good job, uh, yeah, whatever pats on the back, just that, and he's just like, ah, oh, I'm not down for this. <laughs> you know, you've got uh, Corin thinks he defeated Exar Kun. Uh, I think it's Mara who's mostly responsible yeah. for defeating Exar Kun. She comes in at the last minute and saves the day to help Corin to distract Exar Kun so that the other Jedi could trap him with the light side of the Force. Now, on a religious level, I, I do make this comparison, okay? In uh, early chapters of First John, there's the section about dragging sin into the light. And the, the whole point is, as long as sin is in the darkness, it can fester and grow. 
but if if sin then is brought out into the light and you confess your sins if you you know uh, share something that you're struggling with and ask for help and you you don't no longer try to keep it a secret yeah Wes, can you like photoshop a pulpit in front of me maybe like a big bible <laughs> um the, the the point is as long as we allow our sins to be kept secret they will continue to get worse in our bad habits temptations however you want to look at it right but if you are open about what you're struggling with you can get help right and so this was kind of the way that I looked at this was like Exarchoon thrived as a an ancient disembodied spirit of a Sith Lord. He thrived by feeding off people's fears. He thrived off of disunity. He thrived off of living in the darkness. He only worked at night. But as soon as they realized they could drag him out into the light and they would confront him during the daytime, he was weaker. Um, if they came together and used the best parts of themselves if they believed in themselves then they could defeat them am i making sense freddie does that does that add up a little bit yeah it does <laughs> it, it actually does make a lot of sense it, it you know it reminds me of of like let's just say constantine right where he's reading the uh he's reading the bible he's exercising the demon out of somebody and uh, you know imagine reading that in a book where it's just he reads a bible and the, the positivity coming from <laughs> of uh constantine himself brings out the demon so I, I i see what you mean and and when you bring it towards like the, the the theological route it makes sense right it makes complete sense but yeah reading it doesn't really come off that, that no simple. it's not especially <laughs> well spelled out it definitely takes some like some jumping through some interpretive uh, yeah. hoops in order to get there I mean, and yeah. that's what yeah. i'll do hey that's what i'm here for <laughs> if you need confirmation that uh that this series is based on the bible my copy of jedi search came from thrift books <laughs> with Holy Bible inscribed <laughs> on the front of it. <laughs> forgot about that. Oh no, no, my no. God. That's, that's God's will right there, if you ask me. <laughs> if, if you're listening on audio, Nathan's copy of Jedi Search literally has in Sharpie, written by like a child, like a 12-year-old, <laughs> across the cover. It's, it's defaced, and it says Holy Bible. <laughs> Imagine oh, like staying at a that. hotel... And reaching into your nightstand <laughs> this... to get your your Gideon Bible, and instead it's this Jedi copy search. of Jedi Search. I, I, I would not be mad at all. I would go back to that hotel for sure. You know that Exar Kun is haunting that hotel, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Well, uh, ultimately, uh, Luke realizes you know we can't redeem this ancient Sith spirit, but we can redeem everybody else we're just throwing redemption at everybody in this series he uh, never really believes that gantoris is uh, is a villain he always believes gantoris can be saved luke never really believes that that kip is a villain that kip is is has done anything wrong that it's all about the possession for him and and he can learn his lessons and and recover from the error of his ways can we talk about luke's obsession with redemption uh, does does he only have one trick in his playbook um, are there any other valid strategies in terms of uh, starting a new generation of Jedi besides just trying to save everybody and everything? Yeah, yeah. You know, you read that that section in in the trilogy where where his his one fear, right? Luke's Luke's Luke is really afraid of losing somebody to the dark side, and you know he he has it happen to him almost twice, but. He's very much trying to to say, you know, it's okay. Like I've been to the dark side as well, right. uh, according to Dark Empire. Right, right. I've, I've been there. I know what it's like. I know that you're you're trying to do it to be a good person and learn both sides, but it just doesn't work. So, at least he's got that experience, right? Yeah, that that uh, is not talked about much in Legends, but this series does. It really does get into it. And it makes sense now that we've got that alternative history, the behind the scenes on why that is the way that it is. Um, uh, that's not always helpful, though, to be like, you know what? I've learned the error of my ways, too, and so will you. <laughs> um, I, I don't find, at least in ministry, that that's particularly helpful to people. People don't want to know. Uh, so, some people it's helpful for, but like, if somebody comes to me and they're like, I've got a real problem, and I'm like, I've got problems too. You want to hear about them? <laughs> they don't. They don't want to hear about them. That's not what they're here for. If people want help. Yeah, Luke. Luke in this series, and, and eventually is going to be challenged by Corin Horn. You know, and I Jedi, and even Mara. Mara is a good foil for him to be like Luke. You can't save everybody. Not everybody needs to be saved. Sometimes there's real villains 
who need to be stabbed with a lightsaber or decapitated. Doesn't she decapitate Luuk in yeah, um, <laughs> the last command? F's in the chat for Luuk. Poor Luuk. He he never really had a hope. Um, <laughs> Luke didn't try to redeem Luuk. I'd like to get that alternative history. Well, uh, Luke's got some growing to do. Clearly was not qualified to start a Jedi Academy, but it all worked out in the end and there was a happy ending. And um, of course, this is going to be expanded throughout the next 10 years of Legends. We're going to find out more about some of these characters that Anderson establishes. And we've even got a Dorsk 82. All right. If, if Dorsk 81 <laughs> was enough for you, we're eventually going to get Dorsk 82. Guys, uh, last thoughts, uh, final you know, uh, moments here for the Jedi Academy trilogy. We're closing the tome. They're going to put it away forever or at least another few years until we decide to pick it up again. Uh, anything that we've missed here with this legendary trilogy? Well, you know, this is, we, we talked about a couple things in our previous episodes with, you know, derogatory terms in Star Wars. And we definitely get a, a taste of that with Momon Da when he's like, oh yeah, these guys are hammerheads. He's like, actually, we're not <laughs> we, hammerheads. We don't, <laughs> we don't go by that anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, of course, just the, the connectedness, you know, the, before this, you don't have too many Star Wars books that are referencing other Star Wars books. That's so a good point, yeah. To, to see this for the first time and and say, oh my gosh, I know exactly what they're talking about. I read that one and starting to get that vibe of, of what, a, what continuity sounds like. Uh, it, yeah. it's all in this book right and it's it's wonky we've got blob races but it's overall it's it's a it's a solid read and, and it's an important series for uh for legends i mean it establishes kip duran who's such a significant character mentor role to jana solo kind of a foil for luke and the new jedi order they don't get along um we've got that tremendous world building that's happening in terms of uh, kessel which is going to be an important planet for years to come uh, as well as Dala, a very important character who comes back in one of those later long series, forget if it's Legacy or Fate of the Jedi. Um, Dala becomes a much more important, much more well-rounded, fleshed-out character than she was in this trilogy. Um, so so I know I've been a little bit, you know, we've made fun here and there. We poked fun. It's because we love it, all right? It's like I poked fun of my little brother, who, who if he's watching this, you know, you, you should probably read the book before you watch an hour long round table. Okay. It's like we poke fun because we love this <laughs> series, but I will say yeah. what Kevin J Anderson excels at more than anything is capturing the imagination and um, really drawing on the original trilogy and fleshing out. And it's sometimes egregiously so, uh, but at this point in legends, we didn't know not to, right? We didn't know that like, you know, they're really, you should only say, I've got a bad feeling about this, like one time per trilogy. <laughs> you don't have to say it three or four times in every book. Um, never ceases to make me smile, though, for sure. An excellent world builder. Nathan, any final thoughts on Jedi Academy trilogy? Did, did you have a favorite of the three? Let's ask that. A favorite of the three books in the trilogy. Yeah, um, I'm going to go with Jedi Search, too. I mean, the way it sets everything up, and especially, like, the Han, you know, Han and Chewie content. Like, Han is one of the best characters in this trilogy, for sure. And so, you know, Jedi Search yeah, has he a really lot of that. And Lando's also, yeah, Lando, Han too. Well. I mean, they're they're both great characters. But, um, yeah, one thing I don't think we've appreciated enough is, like, the fact that there was, A, another Death Star hidden away, <laughs> but also the most right. powerful weapon in the universe. <laughs> But by, and that that then went into a gas giant, but was then pulled out and used, but was then eventually destroyed for good, along with the knowledge of how to build it. Because if that wasn't destroyed, I'm sure somehow, yeah. you know, somebody would have used that in a later Legends book and we would have had at least one more Sun Crusher. So. Oh Kevin J. Anderson, <laughs> hey, he loves his, his super weapons. His only other full length adult Star Wars novel that he wrote, Darksaber, once again, has another super weapon. So uh, hats off. He's got the hat trick on on Legend Super Weapons. Another Death Star, Sun Crusher, and the Darksaber. And we're not talking about the, the weapon that Darth Maul wields. We're talking about like the big galaxy gun that blows up space stations and planets or something. I don't remember. We'll get there sooner or later. Uh, that's a good point, Nathan. I appreciate that perspective. <laughs> uh, I agree with Nathan. I think Jedi Search is my favorite. I especially love the Gantorus stuff. Jumping up and the the volcano and you got the lava fire jesus and um <laughs> that's a lot of fun for sure walking on the lava um but i do love the back and forth with han and lando on gambling the falcon in dark apprentice that is so funny to me uh freddie you got a favorite of the three i uh, you know it's always i think it's always good to say that the, the first one's definitely one of my favorites but the back and forth with hondo 
Hondo, I said it again. <laughs> this is the second week in a row. <laughs> we'll fix it in post. It doesn't help that one of my buddies' name is Hondo. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Does he just, have a Kowakian monkey lizard? He does not. Yeah, but that important question. Okay. Changed. Can be changed. Has... <laughs> and of course, the blobsicle races. Like, how, how often are you going to see a blob race in a book as important as Star Wars, you know? That's a good point. Absolutely. I think everybody should read. Uh, is it the first book? Second? That's got the think, Blobstable course? Jedi Dark Search? Apprentice. Okay. Uh, everybody on Utini has got to read that. I mean, yeah. it's time that we catch up. Uh, speaking of Utini team members, uh, thanks for filling in for us tonight. Wes, it has been uh, quite the adventure for you to keep us running. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the stream only crashed in its entirety one time. Just So everybody <laughs> give Wes a round of applause. Wes, we didn't ask you this. Have you read these books? Well, absolutely not. I have not. I haven't even heard of these books until I started prepping for the show. But I do have them up in the in the wook, as you like to say. So I do. I might give them. I'm glad you pay attention. Um, (laughs) So I know you don't actually read the books for the roundtables that you're actually (laughs) guesting on. And you have like a a month's notice on. So I didn't expect that you had. But I had to ask. I had to give you a chance. Is that that Um, obvious, huh? (laughs) <laughs> Are you more interested in reading these now that you've heard us talk about it than you were before you had not heard us talk about it? Well, hearing that there is a apparently a Death Star that gets taken in and taken out and taken in, um, <laughs> so, that sounds appealing. Um, let me ask you another question. What is the total length in pages of these books? So that is a big factor in me actually getting around to reading. Yeah, I, I would actually <laughs> recommend, Wes, uh, checking out the abridged audio books. Uh, I've, I've done the abridged and the have read word for word what's happening in these. And you get the gist of it. You know, they're very short. You could listen to all three audio books in nine hours. They're pretty short, like three hours each. So that, that actually might okay. be my recommendation, which is rare that I would recommend that. In this instance, like it's okay to cut some of the pointless story arcs. It really is. <laughs> is that but, the trilogy you have in your hand there? All, all three I've books? got the hardback sci fi book club edition trilogy, which is 700 and some 712 yeah, pages. That's not too the, bad. Th- the three paperbacks is probably about that. It's a different page. It's, like, length it's for- 900 pages about for the three <laughs> paperbacks so <laughs> 700 sounded better 700 west 700 not yeah yeah 700 <laughs> they're really easy to read too though so they are i read that. the entire trilogy in 10 days i also was off work and grad school because of my concussion there was nothing else yeah. i could do and yeah, i read the, the last the two just just take this west i i read the last two in like two to three days so okay. they, they are very much some of the breeziest Star Wars books ever <laughs> written. I well, that found, does it for this I, well, week. I found out in Texas that when your power gets shut off, you can finish a book in two days. So That's right. Um, <laughs> especially if people make fun of you on the podcast for never finishing the books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this has been a ton of fun. Thanks, for Wes, for filling in for us tonight. Thanks to Nathan for guesting with us once again. That does it for Legends Look Back. Uh, next week, there will not be a live show. Of course, uh, thanks to everybody who's been with us live uh, in the chat tonight. Uh, it's, we're, we're glad to have you with us, especially after we crashed and burned the first time. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, nothing happened, nothing to see here. Everything's fine. How are you? But there will be no live show next week. We're going to give Meg another week off as she's excavating um, you know, her basement at home. We also are going to be es- excavating the the treasure trove of legends the forgotten history of legends with everybody's favorite deep diver into the treasure trove of the weird stuff and obscure stuff in legends trevor davy from across the pond is going to be joining us once again for the lost legends of legends and uh, i can't wait it's going to be a ton of fun thanks for joining us on legends look back if you'd like your thoughts read on the show uh, you can email us at legendslookback at utini.com or you can contact us in the Legends Look Back Discord channel. There's always a ton of fun happening over there, talking about noodles and Palpatine and <laughs> um, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And, or you can leave a comment on this episode on YouTube or you can find us on Twitter. You can tweet at us at Legends Look Back with our all new Twitter account over there or you can contact us more directly. I'm at Jared Q. Mays. Freddie? At Wake Up Freddie. Uh, Meg is at Meg Dowell, who I just learned recently has like 1,500 Twitter followers. I've got like like 300, 1,500 Meg's got. Racking up those Twitter followers. So give Meg a few more gems in her infinity gauntlet of social media domination. Uh, also, Nathan. Nathan is on Twitter. Yep, uh, it's Nathan Emery. And how about you, Wes? You on Twitter? 
I am on Twitter. I'm at Boss Wes. Boss Wes. I could have come up with that, but I didn't ask you ahead of time. So <laughs> thankfully, you're still paying attention. If you're looking to buy some of these books, such as Wes, who's got some catching up to do, um, you can go on over to our all new redesigned book profiles at utini.com. And you can click on the Amazon, Thrift Books, eBay affiliate links in the profile. Or, of course, you can leave us a review over there as well and let us know what you think. Uh, which of these is your favorite in the trilogy? Are Nathan and I right? Is Freddie right? Hey, let us know. We'd love to know what you think. And remember, of course, keep the Uchini fan, fan code and be a force for positivity in the fandom. Until next time, may the force be with you. Woo, Wes, we really put you through the paces, man. <laughs> No, no, no.